Thank you, everybody, for coming on this beautiful spring day in New York. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, watching on web and listening to podcast also. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy. And we have a terrific event tonight on fossil fuel subsidies. If they're so bad, why are they so common? Uh, this is part of a regular speaker series that we are uh, holding here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Our, our upcoming events um, in just the next couple of weeks include an event on April 8th on China-Russia energy relations, an event on April 10th on nuclear, nuclear policy and technology with our non-resident fellow Nabuo Tanaka, the former executive director of the International Energy Agency, and on April 28th, we have our Global Energy Summit, which is going to feature almost a dozen speakers, including EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, the CEO of Pemex, the governor of Colorado. It's going to be quite an event. Um, so please visit us at energypolicy.columbia.edu for more information both about our events and about our research programs. Um, for, if you're following us on Twitter, you can uh, ask questions tonight on the hashtag CGEP <coughs> events. It's Center on Global Energy Policy, CGEP events. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really fun for me to start tonight's program by introducing my friend Joe Waldy, uh, who is an assistant professor of public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School. Joe has overcome the handicap of a Harvard degree to go on to great professional success. Um, and uh, his research focuses on climate change policy, energy policy, and mortality and risk, mortality risk valuation. Joe is a non-resident fellow at the Center of Global Energy Policy and is here in residence this week um, doing um, uh, seminars with faculty, public events like this, and, and enriching our lives greatly. Um, Joe, from 2009 to 2010, Joe served in the White House as a senior advisor to President Obama. He, is, he was special assistant to the President for Energy and Environment, reporting um, to both the National Economic Council and the Office of Energy and Climate Change. Um, he served, uh, bef he worked at Resources of Future before that. He was on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors um, in the Clinton White House where he and I met and worked together. And, and I will tell you that in those years, Joe's nickname was Super Joe uh, for his capacity to turn out uh, remarkable analyses overnight um, uh, uh, that got the attention of senior, uh, of senior leaders. So uh, it's really fun for me to introduce Joe Waldy for a talk on fossil fuel subsidies. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. I appreciate those kind words. Uh, I'll report back when I go to Cambridge uh, that there are people outside of Cambridge who think that we can still do something productive despite the handicap of a Harvard education. Uh, as, uh, as David noted, uh, I, uh, I am here as uh, a non-resident fellow at the center. It's been a, a lot of fun this week uh, staying at the center, uh, and I appreciate all the work by everyone at the center in making me welcome. I've had a lot of very productive conversations with faculty and students here and look forward to this uh, serving really as just the beginning of, uh, of our uh, working relationship. Uh, tonight we're going to focus on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, it's, uh, it's an issue that has drawn a lot of attention because how we think about the way we price, the way we produce and consume energy has major implications not just for energy markets uh, but for economic development. Uh, for public health and for the global climate. So I'm going to spend a few minutes here tonight sort of teeing off uh, our discussion uh, with an overview, discuss a little bit about what leaders are trying to do to address fossil fuel subsidies, talk a little bit about the impacts of those subsidies, and then speculate on why they appear despite uh, the stated resolve of leaders, despite an extensive scholarship on the adverse impacts of such subsidies, why uh, they are so common around the world. So let me first start by noting in 2009, in Pittsburgh at the G20 summit, the leaders of the largest developed and developing countries came together to said, we're going to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. In that agreement, the leaders said that they would phase out and rationalize over the medium term inefficient fossil fuel subsidies while providing targeted support for the poorest. They went on to say that inefficient fossil fuel subsidies encourage wasteful consumption, reduce our energy security, impede investment in clean energy sources, and undermine efforts to deal with the threat of climate change. Now, I think this work was important not just because you had leaders in a G20 agreement say, we're going to do something. Leaders all the time 
in various G4, G7, G8, G20, agree on a vast array of policies, goals, etc. But one thing that was a little bit interesting about this process is that the leaders also tasked their energy and finance ministers to identify the subsidies for fossil fuels in their countries and a plan for the phase out of those subsidies. In addition, they tasked major international organizations such as the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, the OECD, and OPEC to do their own assessment of G20 fossil fuel subsidy policies and those plans to eliminate those subsidies. I think it's also important when we look at what leaders agreed to is they use the term inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Now, if I were back having a conversation with my colleagues trained in economics at the Kennedy School, they might be puzzled by the modifier inefficient. Which fossil fuel subsidies might actually be efficient, uh, they would ask. And I would know that this is part of the art of negotiations uh, where sometimes the terms that get used in diplomatic or political discourse may not necessarily square with what we think they mean in the ivory tower. But I do want to note two things about this. There are, in a sense, two exceptions, two classes of exceptions to this phase out. One is for those kinds of subsidies that may be oriented towards fossil fuels that reduce their carbon impact. And the idea here is that if there are subsidies for carbon capture and storage technology, the idea that you'd actually take CO2, say, uh, from the combustion of coal and put it underground before it goes into the atmosphere, that would be permissible. And there are a number of leaders of G20 countries who in 2009 were quite strong champions of such technology. The second exception is for policies that are clearly targeted to the poor. Part of the criticism, and I'll address this in a few minutes, of fossil fuel subsidies is that while some say they are for the poor, very few of the poor in these countries enjoy their benefits. But if you do have a well-designed, means-tested program where the subsidies are clearly just benefiting the poor, that would be exempt from this agreement. And in the case of the United States, we have the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. And while that does provide subsidies to the poor for them to heat their homes, and in some cases buying natural gas or heating oil, that would be considered exempt from this agreement. Now, why is it in 2009, in the depths of the worst recession in three generations, the financial crisis still uh, not that far in the background as the economies of the world were trying to recover, the leaders of the world said, among other things, we're going to take on fossil fuel subsidies. Part of this, I think, reflects the idea that we need to improve the way markets work, and part of it reflects the fact that fossil fuel subsidies have become quite large by this time. In 2008, fossil fuel subsidies were on the order of about $550 billion. They had fallen somewhat to a more modest $400 plus billion in 2010. But as this figure shows, there are a number of countries that had quite substantial fossil fuel subsidies, at least as identified by the International Energy, Energy Agency. In that year, Iran had nearly $100 billion alone in fossil fuel subsidies. In fact, as you look at this chart, a number of the biggest subsidizing countries are either major energy exporters and producers, such as Russia, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, as well as some of the largest emerging economies in the world, such as China and India. But this is uh, representing a very large fraction of what these countries can spend money on in their budgets and represent a meaningful fraction of their economies. So if we also look at data from 2010, there are a total of 14 countries that spent the equivalent of 5% or more of their GDP to subsidize the consumption of fossil fuels. And a lot of these countries, they don't have a lot of spare money to spend on things. If you're spending money on fossil fuel subsidies, that means there may be fewer resources available for the government to spend on education, to spend on public health, or on other socially important investments. It's also important that by spending and allocating all these resources to fossil fuel subsidies, you're distorting the allocation of resources in the economy. There's an array of economic analyses that suggest that by removing these subsidies, these economies will grow faster than they would in the absence of the subsidies. Now, when we think about the impacts that these subsidies have on consumption, it's important to recognize that a majority of the people in the world live in countries in which transportation fuels and electricity are subsidized by the state. The International Energy Agency has estimated that global energy demand would decline by about 4% with a subsidy phase out. It would lower consumption of crude oil on the order of about 3.7 million barrels per day. Now this has important implications, and I think it has important implications when we think about both the diplomacy and the political economy. 
If we see demand decrease that much, we expect to see the price of oil actually fall. So if you're an exporter of crude oil, getting rid of subsidies may not necessarily be in your best interest. You may see the revenues from your exports decline. For those countries, the vast majority of countries in the world that are net importers of crude oil, you're better off when you see these lower energy prices. And in fact, you might see, and in fact, this is what we do see in the analysis, that as overall oil consumption declines, some countries see their consumption of oil go up in response to lower crude oil prices, while in those countries in which their domestic prices now reflect the true market cost and have gone up with the removal of the subsidies, their consumption has gone down. So there are important distributional implications here that I think uh, are, are worth considering when looking at the effects of rationalizing fuel prices. Now, there are those who think that getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies are actually the first important step to tackling climate change. For those who believe, and we've, we saw this especially here in New York in September and the beginning of the last UNGA, a call for putting a price on carbon, that's really important, but we may want to rationalize prices, at least ensure that the prices for energy that, that people are consuming now reflect their market opportunity cost, before we then say, let's go the next step and put a price on carbon. My friend and colleague, Gernot Wagner, who's taught some here at SEPA, uh, had, uh, uh, has recently published a book with Marty Weitzman. We did a book event together earlier this week, and he noted that, in effect, the social cost of carbon globally, when you look at fossil fuel prices, is minus $15 a ton carbon. It's equivalent to saying we benefit $15 for every ton of CO2 we put in the air. That's how much we're subsidizing these fossil fuels. Now, if you look at the best scholarship, it suggests that the price, and in fact, Gernot would argue the price is on a, on a ton of CO2 should be at least $40, and maybe much more than that. And as he notes, we have the sign wrong. So it's important when we think about this that we can get significant benefits for the climate if we were to remove the subsidies on fossil fuels. And in fact, we'd probably be looking at something on the order of as much as nearly 2 billion tons of CO2 that would be avoided by 2020, representing a global reduction on the order of about 7% if we remove fossil fuel subsidies. And going out long term, it would probably represent at least a 10% reduction in our emissions by 2050. And so as we think about the efforts to try to address climate change, over the course of this year, there'll be more and more discussion about the lead up to the Paris talks, what's necessary to prevent dangerous warming of the planet. A single policy effort that could reduce your emissions 10% could be a meaningful contribution to what's necessary to tackle this problem. It's also important to recognize that when we subsidize fossil fuels, we are facilitating corruption in many countries. There's a good degree of evidence about the opportunities for fossil fuel subsidies to enable people to smuggle fuels from subsidized markets to unsubsidized markets. Some of this is in the form of cross-border smuggling. There is some evidence that with kerosene subsidies in Indonesia and their early aughts, that there were individuals who would take the kerosene that was subsidized, smuggle it out of the country, and take it to Singapore, where they could sell it at the competitive market price and make a lot of money. And in India, there is evidence that nearly half of the subsidized kerosene that's supposed to go to households and supposed to help the poor are actually getting diverted into gasoline and diesel markets. And some of the subsidized LPG in the past in India has also been uh, diverted into non-subsidized commercial and transportation sectors. So this is just a quick <coughs> overview of some of the evidence about why these subsidies don't appear to be in our social interest, in our public interest. And yet, as I noted, a majority of people in the world live in economies in which their transportation fuels and electricity are subsidized. So why are these subsidies so common? First, I think we need to consider the question about what actually is a subsidy. And when one looks around the world, there's not an agreement on this. In the process of implementing the G20, staff at the Energy and Finance Ministries spent, I would say, the better part of six to nine months debating with each other, how are we going to define subsidies? In the end, they decided they weren't going to define subsidies. They were going to leave it up to each country in the G20 to define subsidies on their own. And in fact, what we find is that even across international organizations, they use different definitions, different accounting rules. And so as a result, we see tremendous variation depending on who's doing the counting. 
So this table here shows the results for three countries, the United States, China, the two largest energy consumers in the world, and Saudi Arabia, which on a per capita basis is probably the biggest subsidizing country in the world, depending, of course, on who you ask. So if you ask the countries themselves, how big are your subsidies? The United States reports subsidies for fossil fuels through its tax code that are on the order of about $4 billion per year. The OECD says your production subsidies are higher than that because you're not counting the subsidies under state tax policy. In addition, the OECD has reported that the United States has consumption subsidies on the order of about $6 billion. Most of that is the low income program that I referenced at the beginning of the talk. The IMF then has a completely different calculation, which says we don't just want to know whether or not you're pricing the fuel consistent with what the market suggests you do, but that you also include and incorporate all the external cost, the impacts on the global climate, the impacts on local public health, associated with burning those fossil fuels. So instead of being $4 billion, as the U.S. government has identified in the reports through the G20 process, the IMF suggests it's on the order of $500 billion. So just two orders of magnitude difference there for the United States. China and Saudi Arabia say, we really think this is important for us to address fossil fuel subsidies in the G20. We don't have any. <laughs> now, the thing that's fascinating about that is if you were to go to the IEA, which estimates consumption subsidies in developing countries, they say, Saudi Arabia, we think you have about 60 billion in subsidies. In China, we think your subsidies are on the order of about 30 billion. And these are much larger when we look at those external pollution costs of public health and climate change. So I think part of the challenge has been to say we're going to get rid of the subsidies. We don't have an agreement on what we're talking about. And it's very difficult. If you can't decide how to measure something, it's very difficult to then think about the policies to manage that. Now, there are those who argue that fossil fuel subsidies represent a way to pro provide assistance to the poor. It serves effectively as a safety net. And in a number of developing countries, they don't have the capacity to actually provide cash transfers. They don't know how to really design a well-functioning cash transfer program. So instead, they lower the prices of basic needs, such as fuels and electricity, food, etc. Having said that, when one looks at the evidence, one can find that when you subsidize uh, transportation fuels in poor developing countries, the vast majority of those benefits are not accruing to the poor. So the International Monetary Fund has looked at the distributional impacts of petroleum subsidies in countries around the world. This figure here is for their assessment of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. The gray pie piece there shows that about 8% of all subsidies go to the people who live in the poorest 20% of the income distribution. The large red pie piece there, representing 44% of the value of petroleum subsidies in Sub-Saharan Africa, are going to the wealthiest quintile in the income distribution. The poor don't own cars in these countries. The impact this has on them primarily is in buses, and that's about it. It's the wealthy in these countries who own cars, and when you keep the price of petrol and diesel low, it benefits them disproportionately. So one does make this argument about a safety net, but it's not a very well-targeted safety net. So let me close with a couple of comments about challenges to reform and perhaps some of the opportunities. One, we've certainly seen why leaders are hesitant to undertake reform because the attention that the public pays to the price of energy. You raise the price of energy in a number of developing countries, and the next day you will start to see protests in the street. We've seen this in Indonesia. We've seen this in Nigeria. Countries around the world that attempt to rationalize their prices elicit a strong pushback. There's also a question about the attention that leaders will pay to this in the context of the G20. You know, it was con we thought it was fairly consequential when I was in the government and we were working through the G20 to get this agreement to get the leaders of the 20 biggest developed and developing countries to say, we're going to get rid of these subsidies. The challenge has been, though, to really get them to focus on this in subsequent meetings. How we price energy is a secondary issue to what is typically on the agenda in G20 meetings what's happening to Greece or the European economy. That will take more attention in G20 meetings than whether or not we're making progress on this. And I also know that because there's been limited progress by any individual country, it makes it difficult for a leader, since there aren't many leaders who've made progress on this, to sort of shine the light on the laggards and say, you need to catch up and you need to deliver. 
So there's been, I think, a lack of attention in making progress, at least when we think about using our coordinating institutions at the multilateral level. Now, there may be opportunities in really making progress when we make what is effectively the windfall from subsidy reform salient to the public. Some of the public is skeptical that as the government raises energy prices and removes the subsidies, that they're going to use those monies for the public's benefit. We've seen a couple of cases in which countries have had successful reforms, one in Indonesia where they decided to implement a cash transfer program to the poor, and so people looked at the subsidy reform as financing a welfare program. We had the experience in 2010, December 2010 in Iran, where the night before the price of gasoline quadrupled, more than 80% of the population received a transfer in their bank account from the state. So here is a check, effectively. It's a little bit more efficient than running you a check. We're wiring it into your bank account. And hopefully, you won't get quite so upset when you see that the price of gasoline is quadrupled. Still subsidized, mind you, because the subsidies were so dramatic in Iran, but a big increase relative to what they were. Those might be examples of how we can get the public to accept that they're going to benefit from this. That yes, they'll pay higher energy prices, but they will enjoy economic benefits from doing this. And I would say that when we think about ways of trying to promote reform, it may be worth trying to think through how we might be able to lower the cost. And in this sense, I'm thinking political cost of reform. When might there be periods of time in which the cost, political cost of reform are lower? We may also want to think about ways in which we can raise the political cost of failing to undertake reform. And this may help us spur action in trying to better rationalize our fuel prices and our electricity prices, deliver what we think are the potential benefits in terms of energy, environment, fiscal, and economic considerations. So again, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to the Center and to CEPA for hosting this event. Very much uh, look forward to our discussion here tonight. David, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Joe, that was a terrific talk. Thank you very much. In a, in a minute, I want to call up our great panels, but I just, uh, just a few questions uh, before they do it. Just one, um, to what extent are these oil and gas subsidies, or to what extent are they coal? Is there good data on the breakdown between different types of subsidies out there? So, so we, we do have a pretty good sense of the breakdown in subsidies by fuel. And what's interesting, outside of China, there are very few coal consumption subsidies uh -huh. directly. Having said that, there are quite extensive electricity consumption subsidies, which may indirectly subsidize coal. We do have on the production side, uh, the OECD has very detailed data for developed countries. Uh, there are some coal subsidies. Germany is in the process of trying to phase out their coal subsidies. In the United States, of uh, the sort of four, four plus billion in the tax code um, that are production subsidies for fossil fuels, about a billion or a little bit less uh, uh, is for coal. Great, and, and, and one other question. Um, the oil price drop in the last six months has obviously been you know, uh, very significant in, in global energy markets. As, and I think we're going to talk more about this in the panel, but do, do we have any good data on the extent to which that has allowed um, uh, reduction in these subsidies? Well, the important thing to think about the way these subsidies are designed, a lot of them are simply the state sets the price on fuel. Uh -huh. And it's that difference between what's the retail price in a country compared to what that price of fuel would be in a competitive market. Right. And so if the competitive market price comes down because the price of crude has fallen in half, then the implicit subsidy the state has to pay, uh, and, and in some cases the explicit subsidy they're paying if they're a net importer, for example, uh, is a lot lower. So in some cases, if you're Saudi Arabia, it means that your implicit subsidy, it just means there's fewer revenues going to, the, the, uh, to Saudi Aramco and to the state when they're selling, you know, they forego revenues when they sell at a subsidized price domestically relative to the international market. They're foregoing less when the price internationally is coming down. If you're a net importer, there's less the state has to do to make up for the shortfall that the oil companies have when they're forced to sell the oil below market. So we, we do see that that is having an impact. And in fact, if one were to look at the data from the IEA between 2008, 2009, 2010, you see a lot of variation in subsidies. And a lot of that is being driven by the fluctuation we saw in oil prices during that time when they were yeah, going from 140 in 2008 to bottoming out below 40 in 2009. Well, that's great. So um, please, another big hand for Joe. That was great, a great, really great talk. Thank you for doing that. Let me invite our other panelists up here. And let me, um, 
start by inviting um, uh, Professor Johannes Urpelainen, who is a uh, associate professor of political science here at Columbia. His research focuses on environmental policy, energy poverty, international cooperation, and institutions. He has a PhD from the University of Michigan, and he'll be the first of three panelists to comment on Professor Aldi's remarks, and then we'll have a conversation. All right. Um, well, first of all, Joe, thanks for a great presentation. That was very informative and, and useful. And uh, so I'm a political scientist, so I want to talk a little bit more about the second part of your talk, which is why do we still have these fuel subsidies, even though an economist can make a very compelling case for why we should not have uh, any of these subsidies. There's always a better way to do this uh, if our goal is to raise household incomes or lift people out of poverty, fuel subsidies are not a good way to do that. But there's a few reasons why uh, politically removing them uh, is, is difficult. And the first one, Joe already alluded to it, uh, is public uh, backlash. So one of the things we need to keep in mind is that when we think of political instability, protests, and these kinds of things, we are largely talking about urban phenomena. So the people who live in these cities are the people who are often in the middle class who have these cars. So the people who would take to the streets are the people who benefit from these subsidies. Whereas most of the very poor people actually live in the countryside and the government isn't too worried about mass protests in small and remote villages. So that's one thing, uh, especially for author authoritarian countries, there's a lot of research saying that the big threat is protest in the cities. The second thing is that they are uh, similar to Joe's point about some countries benefiting from global subsidies. If you're exporting fuel, you want people to consume as much as they can. They're also within countries, they're groups that benefit from these things. So if you are, for example, in the trucking industry and all your trucks run on diesel, for you these fuel subsidies are very useful. Uh, and as a result of that, there are these organized interest groups that benefit uh, from uh, various kinds of fuel subsidies and who are lobbying for their continuation. And the third argument is that if we want to think of replacements uh, for fuel subsidies, we are thinking of things like cash transfers or social pro-poor policy. Those things often require some administrative capacity. So as Joe was mentioning, Iran was able to uh, simply wire uh, cash uh, to its people and make a reform through that. But most developing countries don't have bank accounts, they don't have national IDs, they don't have these things that you would need to find that replacement. And uh, it also turns out, based on some of the research that I've done, uh, there are institutions in these countries, uh, specifically national oil companies, that actually make it easy for the government to hide the subsidies. So one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of public debate about the cost of the subsidies is that they never appear in the budget. They are in the books of the national oil company, which are usually not very transparent, so people don't actually get to see how much money they are losing because of these subsidies. It's just not uh, in plain sight. Finally, on, on the question of low oil prices, I want to mention that it's not just that low oil prices reduce the implicit subsidy directly. They also create opportunities for reform. So, for example, in the past three, four months, uh, maybe six months, we've seen Indonesia Malaysia and India all remove uh, their gasoline subsidies completely. Not just reduce them, but remove them. And the reason has been that when the oil prices are low and decreasing, nobody notices if you remove the subsidy. The prices are going down in any case, so if you take away the mechanism that you used when you had high prices, nobody's going to pay any attention. The big question now is, will those reforms survive if the price of crude goes back up? I think there is some reason to be optimistic because once they're removed, uh, bringing them back is going to be a much bigger thing than just keeping them if you already have them. But nonetheless, one day the oil prices are going to climb up. I don't know when that day is. But when it does happen, we will see if these reforms are actually stable or if these countries go back to their old bad habits uh, as a result of increased oil prices. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Just, just a couple of follow-up questions. As you were talking, it was wondering is you've done all this research on, on policies to reduce subsidies in countries. Um, and Joe talked about the G20 um, and the G20's agreement in this area. Is your, what's your assessment of the impact of that G20 um, uh, agreement and the G20's work on this? So does that have a significant impact on, on reducing subsidies in, in general or, or not? I wouldn't say that it has had a significant impact. It's generally, in, if you look at the role of international organizations in any policy, they're not usually very good at pushing countries 
uh, to do things that countries don't want to do. Where we can see countries like G, uh, you know, uh, organizations or groups like G20 being useful is they can uh, help countries that are already trying to do this, uh, increase the reputational benefits of doing this. And I think they can also help them sustain the reform because if a country like India now would go back on their reforms, they would face more pressure. Wait a minute, why, why are you doing this now when you already promised that uh, you know, like you're not going to give subsidies anymore? And, and, and just one other question. You, me you mentioned a few positive kind of case studies, but is, is, are there one or two poster children examples of the most successful efforts to reduce subsidies that you would point to in general? Uh, if I think of these recent cases, I would say that uh, Malaysia is a great example because they did it both for uh, diesel and gasoline, uh, whereas Indonesia was a little less uh, thorough. They reduced their gasoline subsidy, removed gasoline subsidies, but left uh, the door open for diesel to continue subsidization. Another interesting example is actually Morocco, which has also removed its subsidies without really anybody noticing. Uh, so that's a great example of a different, gradual, very careful strategy of doing this. Great, thank you. Well, uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Professor Vijay Modi, who is a professor of mechanical engineering here at, at Columbia, um, has his degree from IIT Mumbai and a PhD from Cornell. Uh, he's very active and a leader in um, the UN and a number of different processes, including the Millennium Development Goal processes, um, and, and currently working on a Millennium Villages project in 10 countries. Um, uh, so Vijay, we're delighted to have you here, and the floor is yours. So, Thank you, and great uh, presentation. And also, Johannes made some very good points uh, about how the recent uh, decreases have changed the game. Um, in India, in fact, they announced that uh, they are going to uh, remove subsidies, and it's going to result in a drop of price because the market price actually had become lower than their subsidized price. So it came as a nice, nice announcement <laughs> that perhaps not too many people get upset. So I want, to, uh, I want to focus my comments a little bit on the historical context and how the subsidies as we view them are also not a static thing and they're understanding their, uh, how they are done is also evolving. So I want to give an example from the very sort of poor parts of the world, right? Now, today Brazil is a middle income sort of com country, but there was a point when Brazil had still 90% of the people cooking with wood. Okay. And within a 30 to 40 year period, Brazil man managed to shift 90% of the people cooking on wood to 10% of the people cooking on wood. And you know, we even today are struggling with the health impacts of solid biomass-based cooking. WHO numbers are three something, 3.6 million deaths per year. You know, still a massive problem in South Asia, India, Africa. But Brazil managed to do it 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and how did they do it? And I think they took a fuel at that time, which was technologically not easy at that time to use for the purposes, so they took LPG. And they did a couple of things. They made sure that the price of LPG that the poor see does not change much. It was subsidized to some degree, but in the end, over a 30-year period and all the LPG they sold, they concluded that that subsidy was roughly $1 a month per family, not a huge number, and they managed to shift this entire population away from cooking with solid biomass. So I'm just saying that there are examples that happen now. Other countries, when they came to this sort of later, found it a lot more difficult, as in India today, uh, with the leakage of LPG that you pointed out. But for example, Senegal did it very interestingly. 
and of all the different countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, other than South Africa I've worked in, the survey data shows that Sa Senegal has actually one of the highest penetration of you know, LPG for cooking. And hard to say what it was cost to, but they did one policy 20, 30 years ago, is they started selling LPG in much smaller containers. So most of the countries, an LPG container is 12, 15, 20, 30 kilograms. They started to sell it in two kilogram. So literally for two, three days, or not have somebody imagine that they would shift completely to LPG, but they would cook maybe some critical things or boil water or just, if you had to make a cup of tea or boil milk, they would just use that. And gradually that led to a much increased penetration of LPG for cooking, all without subsidies, right? Mm. So India took a different approach. Um, India was large, vast, diverse, country, so a lot of sledgehammer approaches which didn't work in their nuances very well. But, so a couple of things. They early on did what is a cross subsidy. So petrol or gasoline as it's called here was actually taxed heavily. Diesel on the other hand, and this is the first 30 years, things are changing now again and that's why I want to come to the it's not so static aspect. Diesel was primarily used for trucking. And it was very difficult to quickly <coughs> build roads. They realized that the movement of agriculture produce at a low cost was not just a barrier to the consumer, but a barrier to the supplier as well, i.e. the farmer. Okay. There are extreme examples of this from Ethiopia, when one year through mass, through really amazing programs to incre increase food production, they actually did raise food production significantly and the price of maize collapsed and became $16 a ton in the market because they could not move the product around, okay? And the farmers all lost their shirt and then stopped taking fertilizer on credit, food production again collapsed, right? So, so I think it's, the link of diesel right, in the early period of sort of Indian independence, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, was quite a bit linked to how to reduce transport cost and enable lower, tra tra the, 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 you could have enabled lower transport through better roads, but you know, lots of capital, lots of organization, they did it through subsidizing diesel. So I just wanted to point out, now, however, you know that you can buy a very nice Mercedes car that runs on diesel. That wasn't possible 40 years ago in India. Right? Now, diesel leakage, kerosene leakage, LPG leakage has become a big issue. In other words, the cross use of the same fuel for other purposes has increased. So I'll end by the last, my sort of a technology point and then a comment on electricity, uh, which I've studied more than fuels. So, I, Johannes already uh, alluded to this, but there was a, I'll take an example from a different sector, which is electricity. So, largely electricity to farmers in India is subsidized. There's a complex political economy aspect of it. The service is shoddy. As the service gets shoddy, it becomes even harder to remove the subsidy. But there are examples where in a state, they said, okay, we will only supply eight hours of really reliable power and at a low cost. We went to that state and we talked to farmers and the pervasive belief was, the pervasive belief was that farmers would revolt at the idea of even being metered for such subsidized electricity. Turned out that if you promised them some compensation against that, they were willing to install meters. And the point is that the current subsidy, the way it was, or it is, is what is called capacity-based. 
So if you install a 10 horsepower pump, you pay a fixed cost proportional to the horsepower. So those who use more of that pump end up soaking up more of the subsidy. Those who use less, and our experiments that we did, our understanding from the farmers are that they are actually willing to go away from this mechanism. So I think that, you know, the issue of building up trust with the bottom of the pyramid population, providing them with reliable quality supply may actually allow a room to move away from subsidy. Thank you. BJ, what's the politics of this in India today? There's a new government in India, a new prime minister who's taking on a number of issues, um, casting himself as fighting for kind of reform. What, what's it's the dialogue in India? It's a great question because it's a great question, uh, David, because it, this particular state of Gujarat where uh, Narendra Modi, the prime minister, comes from, no relation, even though I have the same last name. So, uh, so that state, actually was the first state to recognize the following fact. So rural areas had very shoddy power because electricity to the farmers was cheap. Utility did not want to invest in improving service. And he is responsible. There are many people contributed to the idea, but he is res responsible for creating a two-wire system in the state. So he created a new wire with much better reliability, which provides 24-7 power. But from day one, you must fully pay for it. And if there is any theft, severe action is taken. So he literally created, you know, and we never thought that in a monopoly that electricity requires for infrastructure, this would ever be possible. But it ran this parallel wire, and suddenly the consumption on that grew so much that the investment in that new system allowed the cost to be recovered within a few years. So in fact, he demonstrated that there is a willingness to pay the full freight and get good service even in rural areas. However, he had to continue to maintain a separate wire for agriculture purposes. And that agriculture wire is subsidized, so to speak, but it can only be used for agriculture. Hmm. The success of that, the politics of it right now is that he wants to replicate that idea in other states. And I think that at least it's a step in the right direction. Uh, my personal view that today the technology is there to enable targeted subsidy by purpose by farmer without having to draw, build a parallel wire. It can be done through smart meters. Great. We're very lucky to have at the center Keith Bennis, who uh, joined us from the State Department where he was uh, attorney in the uh, Office of Legal Counsel working uh, uh, to support the UN Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change negotiations cross-border infrastructure projects, the North American crude oil market. Um, Keith is uh, a lawyer by training, um, uh, degree from Georgetown, um, and an LLM from London School of Economics has been working on this issue, among others, here for us at the centers. So Keith, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, David. And uh, I realize I should have gone before BJ, just because you, you talked about very practical sort of how things are actually changing on the ground, and I'm going to take us back up from that to a few minutes back about the international system, um, which in many ways feels incredibly removed from actually solving this issue. Um, and to pick up from something that Joe had said about the, uh, the statement from the G20 in Pittsburgh about the reference to effective or inefficient subsidies and the language not matching, um, the way that one would use the terminology in the ivory tower, uh, having spent a decade as a lawyer for the US negotiating things like this, I can assure you that's like a lot of people worked really hard to make sure that language doesn't match the way we use that language anywhere else ever. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but that said, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the importance of uh, that 
G20 statement and the way that the ideas and the gains that one might make politically in that kind of setting with you know, a limited group of very important countries, but still a limited group of countries can sort of percolate throughout the international system. And even though, as Johannes pointed out, we wouldn't say that the sort of outcome from the G20 statement in individual countries has been um, overwhelmingly successful by any stretch, uh, the process is still playing out, right? So when you get that kind of a you know, political statement at the leader level, uh, you hopefully get the attention that uh, within the country that people will actually implement it. But one of the other things it does is it, like I said, percolates throughout the UN system. So one will find since 2009 at the UN Framework Convention uh, negotiations, fossil fuel subsidies are part of the discussions in the negotiations, and uh, many countries' positions you know, have to be changed or modified slightly. And it changes the tenor of those negotiations there because of what the leaders have done in a setting like the G20. In the sustainable development goals that are currently be being developed for the sort of post-2015 system, there is in the energy goals, um, well, sorry, part of the politics of it, it got moved out of the energy goals, but it is a goal about uh, picking up on the G20 language about removing the fossil fuel subsidies. And so it even though it hasn't achieved success yet, it continues to percolate through that system. And each time it comes to a new one of these forums, it means hopefully that as language is agreed, there it goes in, it engages another ministry or another group of officials within the governments who have to think about how to carry it forward. Um, although to Johannes's point about fora like the G20 not necessarily being very good at getting countries to do things that they don't want to do, um, it was in September of last year, we were here negotiating the language for the fossil fuel subsidy language, among other things, and the sustainable development goals. And it, you know, it was a fist fight all over again until five in the morning with that and other issues to get the same language that leaders had signed off on five years earlier. Um, and you find yourself in the negotiations with somebody you know, being like, your prime minister has already said this, why can't we just agree to it again? But you know, the countries retrench and uh, they keep fighting it. That, I guess I'll, and that continues to go on. But one thing that might show a little window of potential opportunity and, and perhaps some little reason for optimism in the international system is in the uh, framework convention on negotiation on climate change now, the negotiations are leading up to hopefully an agreement in Paris this year and countries are in the process of putting forth what are called the intended nationally determined contributions. So it's countries identifying the mitigation action that they hope to take in the post-2020 period. And there's a lot of discussion and pressure um, you behind the scenes in the negotiations for countries to identify as one of the policies that they will reform the fossil fuel subsidies and uh, you know, rationalizing them and phasing them out. Um, and there's some reason to think that the politics of this within countries might be changing slightly compared to where they were even a year ago in response perhaps to the low oil prices is that in the last month or so, um, I've heard even fairly high ranking Saudi Arabian officials mentioning uh, perhaps the need to examine fuel prices as part of the reforms that they're considering. Now, they again, as Joe demonstrated to us, Saudi Arabia does not subsidize fuels, but they do set fuel prices. And so the fact that high-level people are talking about perhaps the need to do that internally, I think, is significant. And in some of the conversations that we've seen, we've seen other surprising countries indicating potential interest in taking advantage of whether it's with the Paris Agreement or just the low prices to make some reforms um, and make progress uh, in this area. So. Uh, not quite sure it's enough to make me actually optimistic, but you know, one does see some signs out there that, that it may feed into these other processes like the climate negotiations to help advance on this issue. Great, well, in a minute I wanna ask Joe whether he has any thoughts or comments on any of what the other panelists have said, but, um, but so Keith, does that mean you're optimistic that the Paris uh, meeting might help advance the ball on this issue, and if so, how would that work? So, yeah, I, I tried to put, paint it into an optimistic picture. Picture. I'm not quite sure I could actually describe myself as optimistic. I think um, 
one of the interesting things that's going on about uh, the process leading up to Paris with these INDCs compared to, say, what happened in Copenhagen when, when countries put their commitments forward um, is that in Copenhagen there was far less detail. So a developing country, say in the case of Mexico, not to pick on Mexico, but because they're, they have already submitted their INDC for the Paris process, but in Copenhagen, you know, their statement about what their commitment would be was just to reduce emissions 30% below some sort of baseline by 2030, full stop. And uh, what countries are doing now with their commitments, you know, it might still for Mexico be expressed as something similar to that. I think it's something in the range of 22 to 25% below a base, you know, business as usual baseline by 2025 or 2030. So it's still framed that same way, but it's supported by five pages of discussion of here are the national, here's the national legislation and policies we have in place to do this. Uh, here are the other systems that we went through to develop our uh, commitment here. Um, here's why we think it is fair, and not just developing countries, but also developed countries are doing this. So it would be an opportunity that didn't exist before for countries to um, identify a subsidy reform and it, if, if countries would do that, I think, again, with Johannes's point, it would be a strong signal that, uh, say, a country who may have signed on to a, a general G20 statement or even something in the Sustainable Development Goals about phasing out fossil fuel subsidies might be more serious if they're offering it up in a context where it's just them expressing it themselves. And even though it's a non-binding commitment, I think it could be a strong indication of a sort of shift in the domestic politics or their view of the domestic politics that they want to take action. Mm -hmm. Now that said, Mexico being the first developing country that submitted their INDC and sort of setting the tenor of how those might go did not include anything about fossil fuel subsidy reform among its various things that it did. So you know, we'll see whether or not that actually bears out. Well, thanks. So for those listening by podcast, uh, I'm David Sandalo. We're here discussing fossil fuel subsidies with, uh, with Joe Alda, Johannes Erpelainen, Vijay Modi, and Keith Bennis. And Joe, um, you've just heard some really interesting comments by fellow panelists. Any Thing you agree or disagree with or want to highlight? Uh, so let me, uh, let me make two comments. One, I think, to what Keith was just saying about the interplay between the climate negotiations and what we've seen with G20 leaders on fossil fuel subsidies. I, I think it would be important if we can get people in these governments to actually talk to each other. Because it was, to me, somewhat surprising that when you looked at Copenhagen, no one is really talking about fossil fuel subsidies in Copenhagen, even though this was a meeting that had, in the end, more than 100 heads of state, uh, 25, 28 of whom had participated either in the uh, Pittsburgh meeting of the G20 or the Singapore meeting of APEC, which agreed to basically the same language as what the G20 did that fall, just a few months earlier. No one was talking about fossil fuel subsidies. There were opportunities for developing countries. And what they put on the table and what was inscribed in the, the sort of, if you would, developing country pledges under Copenhagen, some of them did describe policies, not just goals. They could have said, we will rationalize fuel prices, and not one of them did that. So there, there appeared to be this disconnect between the parts of the government that think about and negotiate climate and those who are really, for the most part, you know, economics, planning, and finance ministries serving their heads of state in the G20 process. So I think since then we've seen more and more of the conversation try to bring fossil fuel subsidies into the climate talks. I think that would be productive. Because part of this, even though these are voluntary measures, when we have heads of state, when we have delegations say we will do this, even if it's voluntary, it raises the cost later politically if you fail to do that. And in fact, it's a way when it's very hard when we say there'll be a future president or a future prime minister and they can just change their mind and walk this back. They can do that, but there are costs to doing that because a commitment has been made previously. They have to defend why they are changing the policy and why they're doing something that their predecessor thought was to their benefit and to the benefit of the broader global community. So I, I think part of this is that by, by promoting this transparency, it helps to sort of raise some of the political costs of people walking back some of the success that we're seeing going forward here. The other thing that I think is important, and this relates to both what Vijay and Johanna said, uh, is that the role of special interests, of vested interests, there are clearly those in these countries who benefit from fossil fuel subsidies, from having low energy prices, and they do work, and they do lobby to try to maintain these. 
And, and I think it is something for us that's important to think about. And in fact, um, I remember having a conversation with Scott Baer here on the faculty about this. And, and uh, we had a conversation about why do you need international coordination to rationalize your own energy prices? And he drew the analogy to trade. It's like, for a lot of this, we feel like tr you know, free trade's in your interest. At the end of the day, you, talk, you look at most economic models, free trade is in everybody's interest. And yet there is, it is so difficult to negotiate the lowering of tariffs and other trade barriers. And that's because really trade policy is not driven by how do we maximize social welfare because we're going to get a bunch of economists and have them decide what's the best trade policy. We have a political economy in which special interests express their preferences and try to shape policy. And so in the end, we need this kind of coordination. And in doing so, it makes it easier to get deals done if we think that we're going to be simultaneously undertaking these actions. And we can learn what works. And maybe the transparency of the international institutions sort of helps nudge us uh, in that direction uh, and provide sort of a counter then to some of the, the weight of, of, of views that special interests may have in their own domestic politics. Uh, we have a question from Twitter, which I wanted to throw out just for the entire panel. Um, someone uh, wrote in, you mentioned example of cash handouts um, to phase out subs in iron, I think. Oh, oh I'm sorry, in Iran. In Iran. You mentioned example of cash handouts in Iran to, to phase out subsidies. Any thoughts on whether this is a good alternative? So that, that's, I think you touched on the summit you're talking about. Right, I, I mentioned this, and, and what's interesting is that not only did Iran do that, but in 2008, and, and it's, sort of, it's a similar kind of thing. British Columbia, when they decided they were going to put on a carbon tax, and they put on an economy-wide carbon tax in the province of British Columbia, the month before the carbon tax is implemented, they sent a check to every household in the province. And they said, this is your dividend. We're going to be cutting taxes, and they did. They cut both uh, personal income and business income taxes going forward, but they wanted to make it very clear the government isn't just going to impose a new tax, raise the cost of energy, raise the cost of goods you may buy, and you don't get anything from this. So I, I, think, I think it's important Now there may be, you know, economists who say you really want to just be changing marginal rates, sending a check isn't sort of changing uh, marginal tax rates, you're not changing behavior on that, but I think it's really important from a public support standpoint to be able to signal that this is not just the government taking more money and you're not getting anything for it. It's to say these subsidies cost a lot and we're going to cut them, but we're going to provide at least part of the windfall from doing that to you. And, and I think that, that is, that's important if you can do that effectively to try to combat the kind of people going to the streets or the people lobbying hard their government through other means uh, to try to reverse the policy. And they paid out the money beforehand, you're saying? They paid out the money Very beforehand. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Johannes, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, th there are many other examples of this as well. So in India, actually, they tried to remove the, uh, reduce the LPG subsidy through a cash transfer program, but they had to kind of pull back out of it because of this special interest politics. We have a PhD students here in our sustainable development program who wrote a dissertation on that and found that it was a fantastically efficient solution. It solved all these problems in one magic stroke, but unfortunately, the national level, high, high level politics created a lot of trouble. And now that I think they are trying to figure out if there's a way to restart that particular program. So I think, um, let me ask actually, just I don't have an answer but a practical question to political scientists and economists. And a lot of this stuff in India gets decided by the bureaucrats, and the bureaucrats have some imaginary vision of what the poor will do, okay? And we don't actually have a good answer to the following question. That suppose a poor household was being given let's say $10 a month in form of LPG or in the form of food rations. If instead you give them $10 in cash, no voucher, so it's not like a food stamp that can only be bought for food, even though we know food stamps can be traded. To me, the question of, you know, there is this belief that if you give that $10 to the poor, even if you give it to them in an account, it goes to the woman, women are smarter, I agree with that. And you know, the belief is that the man in the home will get hold of it and drink it up. 
I'm just being very class and crude, but this kind of underlying belief mm. about cash transfers is still pervasive. And my question to Johannes, to Aldi, is there any literature in the policy world from other countries that definitively answers that question one way or the other? Because that would help, you know, make a case. So, um, Johannes, I, I can. Uh, I, I don't think there's a definite answer. I think it depends on the conditions and all that. But I do have a colleague, uh, Chris Blattman, who's both a SIPA and a political science faculty member. He's written extensively on cash transfers in poor countries, especially in Uganda. And what he finds is that most of the money goes to things like capital for small business, uh, savings, food for children. Very little of it goes to things like tobacco or alcohol or so on. Uh, so I think the perception that we have is. Uh, based on the evidence we have is wrong. Mostly poor people are not any worse in making investments than rich people are. Uh, it's just that they are living in difficult conditions. That's, a, that's, by the way, a great message to bring to the Indian yes. economists. Very is there, in a moment we're going to go to the audience. I just want, and if, if any of the panelists have questions that they would like to ask the others, I want to invite them to do that. But um, I want to talk a bit about production subsidies in the United States. We touched on that, but Joe, maybe if you could just explain what our subsidies are here and what the politics has been around that. Right. We've been talking about other countries too. So through the tax code, uh, we subsidize oil, gas, and coal. For the most part, these subsidies operate in a way of lowering the cost of exploration and, and eventually bringing uh, the oil and gas uh, to the surface. Uh, some of these subsidies have been on the books for a very long time. Uh, when you sort of talk about sort of who is most effective as, uh, as a lobbyist on tax policy, less than a year after we actually had the income tax uh, implemented through an amendment to our Constitution, there was already a carve out for what is known as, I think poorly termed, because it's not very clear what it means, intangible drilling cost, uh, mm. which, is, which are a, a class of expenditures. They're not truly intangible. Um, but but uh, the idea is that you can expense these uh, immediately instead of depreciating them over the life of, uh, of the well. And so it may be things like building a road out to uh, the wellhead would be something that you could expense immediately as opposed to what might be, uh, if it were, say, associated with the, uh, another capital investment, like a manufacturing facility, you'd have to depreciate that over 10 or 20 years. And so there's sort of the time value of money that comes into play when you can expense that all at once instead of having to do it amortized over a very long period of time. Uh, and, and, and for the most part now, there have been revisions to some of these uh, 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 oil, and tax, uh, oil and gas tax subsidies. For the most part, they benefit smaller producers. The really big companies, uh, you know, your Exxon Mobil, your BP, Shell, uh, they, they uh, enjoy actually a relatively small amount of these subsidies. Some are targeted only to small or independent producers. Yeah. Um, they are on the order of about four billion a year, although that's been increasing in recent years, in part just because we're producing more oil. Uh, I, my sense is though, uh, these don't have a meaningful impact on oil and gas production. These are basically just a, tr a transfer from other taxpayers to those who are undertaking these uh, oil and gas investment projects. And so, uh, you know, there was one I was asked, well, what's, you know, these have got to be really bad for the environment. And my response is actually, no, because they don't change anyone's behavior. They're just bad for the people who pay taxes. Because you and I pay more in taxes to make up for the fact that these guys are paying less in taxes. So, um, there, there's been a push uh, in the Obama administration since the very first budget proposal in 2009 to eliminate these. Uh, and to be honest, there has been a lukewarm interest on both sides of the political aisle in Congress. Uh, and so uh, as a result, there have been a few bills introduced in Congress, but they haven't gone really anywhere that might try to reform these. And the question is whether or not there has been some discussion by Republicans of, why don't we just get rid of all energy subsidies? get rid of the subsidies for solar, for wind, for efficiency, as well as hydrocarbons. Let's just get rid of all of them. And uh, I think the challenge there is, well, I think there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to subsidize fossil fuels. They're bad for local public health, they're bad for CO2, uh, if they have an impact even on those things, but you're just giving money away. Wind and solar 
delivers some important environmental uh, and health benefits. A and so I think there's a reason to have policy that would try to support them, whether it is through the tax code or perhaps through other, say, climate change policy. Uh, but, but it is something that has been, for something that's relatively small in magnitude, uh, the oil and gas companies, uh, companies have fought very hard uh, to maintain these subsidies. Very good. Um, let me invite anybody from the audience who would like to ask a question. Um, we've got, can we bring the microphones around? Do you want people? Uh, Couldn't. There, the microphone's coming to you. Thank you. And please identify yourself. Okay, thanks. Um, my name's Lindsay Ashby. I'm with the World Energy Forum. And I listened to spotty pieces of the discussion on my way here, but I'm wondering if the United States is anywhere close to the India example, where uh, the price of subsidies is actually, or the cost of fuel, et cetera, with subsidies is um, less than the price of, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. But in the India example, you said they eventually got rid of subsidies because the price is actually lower, right? So I'm wondering if the United States is anywhere close to that. And then with regards to like larger institutions like the API, um, what is their position? I, th I think that may be a rhetorical question, but are they doing anything to encourage this? Or is there any sort of champions of this cause on a large national level? Thank you. Okay. So where is the United States on, on pricing issues and then the position of the American Petroleum Institute I think you're referring to, if, any, if anybody knows that. So Joe, you right. want to handle this? So, so on, on pricing, uh, when we look at fuels in the US uh, and, and electricity, uh, we don't see any real subsidies uh, in that market. Uh, the IMF would say there are subsidies if you are failing to account for the pollution impacts associated with burning the fuels. Uh, but just in terms of are we paying the sort of market price, what should be the competitive price without government intervening in the market, we're paying above that because we do have taxes on, on the transportation fuels at both the state and the federal level. They're, they're modest taxes relative to, say, Europe, Japan, Korea, but there's still taxes and they're still above the competitive price. Uh, API uh, doesn't like this discussion. They, they, they have pushed back hard and in fact they typically say, we don't receive subsidies, we pay more in taxes than any other industry in America. Uh, which kind of misses the whole point. It's not do you pay taxes, it's that do you receive benefits that disproportionately drive capital towards you because some of your activities pay lower or in some cases no taxes. And there are some drilling operations where their effective tax rate is negative. So it's, it's for some of the independents and some of the small operations, they truly are paying negative taxes, which means they do have an explicit subsidy. It's not just lower taxes, it's, it's they're, they're getting a, a, a straight out subsidy. But API has pushed back hard on this uh, they, they push back hard in general on tax reform ideas that have come from this administration. And I would just note that we, we like to present all sides of the issue here. We don't have somebody from the American Petroleum Institute to respond to this. I'm sure they would have a response if they were here. Um, uh, sir. Hi, Steve Kretzman with Oil Change International. And um, not to put too fine a point on it, but I feel like there is a reason why API is pushing back hard on this, and it's because production subsidies are really important to them for continuing their drilling and expanding their drilling, right? So there was an article by Ed Crooks in the Financial Times the other day where he talked about the frack log that's happening in North Dakota where there's been sort of a shut-in of production waiting for the new subsidy to go into effect which will take effect after WTI has been less than 55 for five months, which will be in June, right? So. Uh, there's a huge amount of production being shut in, waiting for that to take effect. In addition, um, T. Boone Pickens has said in some forums, I'm not sure publicly, but certainly privately to people, that without the intangible drilling credit, there would have been one third to one half less wells drilled in the US. Um, and then there was another article recently on the Norwegian Arctic production subsidy regime where they can deduct up to 78% of costs for going up there. So I think it's really important to the industry for expanding their reserves base. And that, as we know, is really important to profit for the industry. So, uh, so it's really key, actually, I think, particularly from a carbon budget point of view. You know, if we look at IPCC and the climate science, we see 
we're going to have to find a way to keep three quarters at least of existing fossil fuel reserves in the ground if we want to stay below two. Production subsidies are completely counter to that, and I think they're really important to focus on. So, so Joe Aldi, if, if I understood your earlier comment correctly, you do not agree with the comment that right. was just made here. Yes. So could you explain the basis for your disagreement with those assertions? I, I mean, there, there are certainly some of the small and independent producers that say these are important. And part of it is because it, is, it does lower their cost of financing projects. I mean, most capital projects in America, you have to go out and do this thing called raising money. And, and these tax these tax expenditures really lower the cost of them doing that. And, and it, it changes fundamentally their cash flow in a way where they don't have to go out and raise nearly as much. They don't have to leverage these projects like you might in, say, any other part of the U.S. economy where you want to make a capital investment. So, so it does lower their cost. Having said that, when one looks at historically the change in U.S. production and, and we can see that production does change in response to, say, the price on oil. There doesn't appear to be any evidence that these subsidies are having a meaningful impact when prices are low. Uh, there have been some changes to these. You don't see a change in production activity as a result to it. Uh, so I, I, I think that they, they certainly think it's important because it, it really affects their margins. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, what we're talking about is for some of them, they have to change their business model, their investment model, basically, if you were to get rid of these subsidies. The other thing I would note is when, when you describe, it's a law that I'm not familiar with, but you describe something as saying, when the price is low enough, long enough, you'll start to get a subsidy. I wouldn't say, oh, the subsidy is really important for investment. I believe that you've just designed a policy with really bad incentives. You've designed a policy to say, you need to wait, and then you'll get your subsidy. And of course, a good businessman says, I will wait then. So, so I, I think that this is one where it's a, it's a description of the subsidy. Uh, and the way it's been designed is modifying behavior in a way that you probably would not want to do. And, and, and so that, it, to me, that's just a question of sort of faulty policy design. Um, but I, it, it's, it's not clear to me. I mean, T. Boone Pickens can say what he wants to say on this. I've also seen analysis by other, uh, 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 by other scholars where their assessment on the impact on production activity is measured in less than one percentage point. I mean, one analysis that was done by the former head of the um, uh, oil and gas office at the Dallas Federal Reserve uh, Bank said that if we got rid of these subsidies, oil production in the U.S. would fall on the order of about 25,000 barrels a day. Hmm. Our incremental growth in oil production in the U.S. every month since 2008 is more than 30,000 barrels per day. So it basically means we'd slow down a month and then return right where we were going before. So I think the impact on production is really, really small here. And it's really more of a transfer from taxpayers to the oil and gas companies. I think we just came up with another event here for the Center on Global Energy Policy. We should get Mr. Pickens here um, to talk about <laughs> his point of view um, and, and get a discussion going on this very topic. And I think we should extend an invite. Uh, I want to come back. Uh, if there are any other questions in the crowd, okay, that, um, are there are a couple. Um, I, I just want to touch quickly and then go to the couple of questions in the audience, and then we'll close up on, on some of the UN activities around this, because I know both, um, uh, both uh, Vijay Modi and Keith Bennis have been involved in this, and there's a whole discussion around new goals um, that the um, uh, UN will be announcing in 2015-2016. Could you just say a word about that and the extent to which fossil fuels are part of this discussion? So I, I follow more how these discussions impact the poorest countries. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you more from that perspective. Okay. Right? So, you know, the entire effort around this last two, three years on sustainable energy for all, um, which was a kind of loose but growing momentum uh, and then significant momentum situation was that there was a lot of tension between the more wealthy countries and the poorer countries. The wealthier countries were, you know, more pressing for stronger standards on renewable penetration and accelerated efficiency standards. That, you know, you should be doubling 
the rate of efficiency improvement every year compared to what it is and that the renewable percentage should be twice, things like that. Whereas the poorer countries were pushing for access targets. What I see today is there is still an internal kind of ongoing tussle that if I am Mozambique or Tanzania and I discover natural gas on offshore, which they have done in massive amounts, the feeling is they should be able to use it as a way to push their economy forward and that they should not have to have the burden of climate change on their back when quantitatively much of that CO2 was put out by other countries. So I think that that tussle is still there and partly it is still there because mechanisms to help those countries have been talked about but not in place yet. Great, thank you Vijay. Um, let's see, we've got a, number, a couple of questions. Let me, I saw this woman Okay, uh, I'm sorry, the microphone's over here. Sir, my apologies, please uh, identify Hi, yourself. my name is Yavar Herker. I'm a student at uh, SIPA. So my question is that given that all subsidies are um, by countries which are all producing are meant as a social safety net for their citizens, uh, it's very hard to remove them. So a lot of Middle Eastern countries have actually, uh, they're moving towards renewable energy so that they can substitute that um, for oil consumed domestically and then they can export that. So what are your thoughts on that? What's the pace um, and progress on that? And do you think this is a suitable alternative for other countries to follow? Uh, so, so I'll note, I mean, one thing that's interesting in, in other countries that, that we may not necessarily think about in the United States, in the United States, we don't really use oil in our power sector anymore. So, so there's really not much sort of competition or opportunities for substitution for renewables for oil in the U.S. unless we're thinking about biofuels. Uh, and, and many other parts of the world, and certainly when we look at the energy exporters in the Middle East, they use a lot of oil in their power sector. And in some of these countries, they also have a lot of sun. And, and in fact, there have been discussions not just of using solar to power them, but also using solar and perhaps bringing it north into Europe. So, so I think there is potential there. Uh, I think there's been, there have been some efforts, I think some, some good faith efforts to try to push out on, on, on wind, I mean, excuse me, on solar in, uh, in these countries. Um, I, I think it's tough, um, though, to do that when you're competing with really, really cheap oil. I mean, there's a question of whether or not, you know, if the state's making decisions on the price of oil, maybe it just makes a decision on whether or not we use oil in the power sector. And so the price of how cheap you get solar down may not matter as much if you just make the state, the state just makes a decision, we're now going to use a lot more solar in our system. Having said that, you're still going to need oil, um, potentially gas, as a way of dealing with the fact that it's not always sunny or that demand is exceeding what you're getting out of, uh, out of those. So you'll still need some dispatchable sources of power. But I, I think there is some, some potential there. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to let, take a little time to see how it plays out. So yes. To add a few things on that, so one thing, the, uh, I think Joe's actually right that the, the use of oil in the electricity sector is really the problem for these countries. It's terribly inefficient. And they're losing a lot of money because, because of it. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that renewable energy uh, in the industrialized countries in particular has been grown through policies that promote things like independent generation, feed-in tariffs in Germany, and so on. But that's not possible in these Middle Eastern countries because they have these old-fashioned, vertically integrated power sectors. So they need a very different set of policies to promote this. And in fact, even the question of price is, a, is fairly complicated there because ultimately there is one utility tr controlled by the energy ministry that decides what to use. So in principle, the government could say, regardless of the price, you must use more solar electricity. Now, they haven't really been doing that so far, but they might require a different mix of policies to get to that goal. And so there's some issue of policy learning here as well. Great, we're, we're almost out of time, but I think we have two or three questions here. Why don't we take them each and, and then we'll have the uh, panelists comment and a final round of comments. Please. Hello, my name is Laura Somlad. I'm a SIPA alum and now I work for ARC Finance. 
and we work with household level financing for clean energy and especially most of our partners are in India and so it con this question continues actually on this topic of oil versus solar but on a household level so when you're choosing to use a kerosene lantern or a solar lantern the kerosene subsidies as inefficient as they are are still bringing the price down and making the solar less competitive and at the same time our partners are constantly telling us that the solar subsidies that do exist in India, because India has really high targets for solar use as well, are not being used by the consumers. They can't access them. The administrative capacity isn't there. So I was wondering if in your studies you've come across particularly successful ways of incentivizing renewable energy use at the household level. If we can't get to like a universal energy voucher or a cash transfer, something that's at least going in that direction that India could use. Thanks. I happen to know that VJ Modi, among others, knows a lot about that topic. But, so um, I, well, I, but before you answer, oh, let me just take this comment here, and then we'll just go down for a final round. Um, my, my question, oh, Please. I'm a, uh, a, a JFK alum, so. Hello. Uh, Welcome. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to, you made a comment about, and this is not meant, um, um, you made a comment about the uh, the, what is it, the uh, carbon tax uh, that people on 922 or 23 when they had the People's Climate March were marching for climate for a carbon tax. I doubt that anybody in the, in the crowd thought that they were marching for a carbon tax. But my real question is how do we, in the United States, move to renewable energy uh, so that, uh, you know, quite quickly uh, rather than uh, you know coal and oil and gas, uh, which is used uh, and you know in the uh, you know the in the utility uh, market, uh, there's a move. The trend is toward vertically integrated, so that they can really take advantage of a carbon tax if one is implemented after the <laughs> next the end of this year. So that's well, my comment. Uh, thank you very Question. much. Question. So we have. Uh, we have five minutes. We have four panelists. I think that's about a minute and 15 seconds each, gentlemen. Uh, why don't we just go down, start with Keith, and then go to, for closing comments down the line. Okay. Uh, since I don't have a direct answer to either of those questions, I will keep mine to about 20 seconds, um, which is just to say that I think that it is uh, somewhat hopeful that in the next couple of years we might see some real progress in an increasing number of countries in taking steps like Indonesia and Malaysia have and India has in response to the low oil prices and in thanks to some of the international pressure. And the bigger question will be uh, developing the longer term strategies that help sustain that and help do uh, turn that into an actual transition towards you know, more renewables, better energy efficiency, et cetera. And that's, you know, people should start thinking about that durability of those types of reforms as well. Thank you, Vijay Modi. Okay, so I'll address the issue that the uh, ARC finance uh, people raised. So, one observation, first of all, I have is that poor are willing to pay for good quality service and reliable service. So I'm actually beginning to see a shift away from kerosene, even at the somewhat subsidized and now as subsidies removed. The, there's an example of Bangladesh where they very thoroughly thought through all the institutional mechanisms that were needed. I encourage you to look at that and they are massively rolling out solar systems, solar home systems for the poor. And I finally want to just make a comment is that while we talk about all the incentives and technologies for renewables, it seems the fossil fuel industry is not also sleeping and they are also working very hard to drive the cost of fuels down. And I'm not so much worried about the subsidies on the fossil, but the actual absolute costs of the fossil fuels becoming lower and lower. Johanna Terpelinen. So I also want to comment briefly on the energy accesses. So I'm working in India with a company called Meragao Power, which provides these sort of village level microgrids. And what we see there is that the kerosene subsidy is a big part of the problem because there is, as soon as you provide solar power to a village, there's a collapse in demand for private market kerosene, but the public available subsidized kerosene consumption remains exactly the same. So I think one of the things these countries could do is would be to give households an alternative to move away from kerosene and get a solar subsidy. There are other, I think, administrative things. A single window approach where anybody can apply for a uh, subsidy for their solar product through one website 
and get a guaranteed decision in three months would be great, compared to today when you have to go through 10 different ministries and nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, on the point on the United States and renewables, that's a very difficult uh, challenge. I think I would say that from a climate perspective, uh, our sort of barring the possibility of a great carbon tax, which is my favorite approach, would be that I think we need to think carefully about how to get rid of coal in particular. Coal, I think, is the, is the worst of the fossil fuels right now. It's the one that's already in trouble, so I think there is an opportunity to substitute a lot of uh, fossil fuel for much better alternatives. Joe Aldi, thank you again for spending a week with us as a non-resident fellow, Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, you get the last word. Thank you, David. It's been a great week. Uh, it has flown by, uh, and so I, I look forward to, to my next visit. Um, let, me, let me make a couple of comments. One, uh, while you may not have been having conversations about the beauty and elegance of a carbon tax well, uh, uh, on the march uh, back in September, I, I, I do want to note that there was a statement issued that more than 70 countries signed up on, uh, signed up to, and more than 1,000 companies saying we should price carbon. So, so that, that was announced as a part of all that was going on that week. So, um, uh, so, th so there, there is this thinking out there, we need to take into account carbon. And in fact, there are a lot of oil companies that when they make investment decisions, they are actually using explicitly a price on carbon to assess whether or not they think this project will be economic in the future when there might be some kind of climate policy affecting it. So, so this is something that I think it, that, that people in business are, are considering. When we think about the transition to renewables, I think what's happened with natural gas in the power sector displacing coal in the last half dozen years is really instructive to how important prices can be. The price of natural gas came down. It took out, in a matter of about three years, one quarter of coal's market share. Huge impact on coal. If a government regulator did that, I assure you they'd be hauled up to Congress to explain why they're being so bad on coal. That, I mean, you know, when people talk about a war on coal, and talking about regulators, I say, you know, there, there is a war on coal, and it's being waged by natural gas, and natural gas is doing a good job in that war. Uh, they have brought down the cost dramatically. It's because of a lot of the innovation in, in how they develop this. And I think that's what's important. When we think about trying to push out renewables, we need to think about how do we help bring down the cost of renewables on the innovation front. But we also need to think about, well, should these fossil fuels be carrying the whole load that they are imposing on society? If they're imposing public health costs, they ought to pay for that. They're imposing costs on the global climate. That's public health costs in the future. They ought to be paying for that. So I think if there's ways in which we can design public policy, whether it's some ideal carbon tax down the road or using some of the policies we have on the books now at the state and federal level, that will help rationalize the prices in our energy system, get us to a better, I think, public health outcome and a better economic outcome. And that's the big picture to me when we think about fossil fuel subsidies. We just need to get the prices right. We're spending a lot of money so people can consume too much of something that is dirty and bad for public health. We're, we're allocating our resources inefficiently and that slows economic growth. And it's reducing the amount of resources we have in our government uh, treasuries to spend on things that are really important social investments. So if we get the prices right, which means overcoming a lot of tough special interests, but if we can get the prices right, we can actually make a lot of things better. And, and that, that's what I hope uh, that you, uh, you're able to draw, away, draw from it here in our, our discussion here tonight. So uh, please join me in thanking Joe Aldi and our great panelists.